Wayne Craig has been working as an independent researcher and historical consultant. Much of his work involves evaluations of historic properties for the National Register of Historic Places and for landmark status under local preservation ordinances. And considering his amazing resume, we are very fortunate that he's been working on a little manuscript called Laird Library <laughs> Legacy. <laughs> so we're excited tonight to get a little preview of this and a, kind of a teaser for the library's September 12th event when we'll be celebrating William Laird's philanthropic gift of the library for the city of Winona. So without further ado, Thanks, Carol. So, um, this is uh, kind of a progress report. And um, uh, a while ago, uh, really came out of discussions with uh, Julie Johnson and Chad Ubel. We talked about uh, how a uh, history of the library would be a good idea. So, we we're really talking about kind of a small book that would be a history of the library. A lot of, a lot of towns have these already, and I think we should have one because we have a really exceptional story to tell. But um, obviously, uh, a history of the library is a good thing to have uh, in its own right, obviously. But uh, we talked about this uh, in a larger way. So the, the idea we had was that to produce a history of the library that would be part of a larger project of increasing the profile of the library in the community and raising the question of how the community could better support the library. So obviously the assumption behind all this is that this library needs more support, more help, more funding, um, all kinds of things. Uh, and, um, and so this uh, book was a, was a way of doing that. And so obviously the connection uh, is this. The building we're standing in was the result uh, of one single spectacular act of philanthropy uh, by a really interesting character. I brought his picture in there with William Harris Laird. And so by uh, telling the story of the library, one of the things we would be doing, obviously, is telling that story, which is really a kind of remarkable story. And I think by bringing that story to uh, larger attention in the community, uh, maybe some people's mind will begin to think, that something like this needs to happen again, right? And so, so that's the kind of the underlying idea. So, I mean, like I said, having a, having a history of our library is a great thing just in itself. But we were really thinking about a, kind of a larger project of trying to build, uh, I think it's fair to say, a, a larger movement uh, around supporting this library uh, than, than exists today. Okay, so that's that's the idea. So, uh, so we started working on that, and um, uh, we got a grant to give me a little bit of money to start working on it. And so I've been working uh, for several months uh, in the in the old director's room, uh, where there was a vault, and in that vault there was all kinds of interesting things. And so I've been working there quite a bit. And I want to say, uh, first of all, that um, over the last two or three months I've been uh, kind of a guest here, not, not just a patron of the library, which I always was, but really a guest of the, of the librarians. And it's been really wonderful. All the librarians have just been really great. And uh, I get to use Chad's desk in that, in that office there and work at all the materials in there. And, uh, and every, every, it's really been wonderful. And um, so I, I uh, want to thank people for that. I, uh, I brought in, and we'll, people can look at this a little bit later, but uh, uh, in that vault, the reason I've been working in the vault is there's all kinds of interesting things. And I just brought a few of them in. This, this is a remarkable thing. This is, this is the minutes. Oh. of the board of the, of the Winona Free Public Library from the, the year it was, or the day it was begun in 1886 up to about 1933. Oh. So this has been a great source and this is one of the things we found in there. There's other things like that back there too. You can take a look at it. I got it uh, opened up to the page in uh, January 21st, 1899 uh, when William Laird uh, came to this building uh, to make the final presentation to the city of uh, this building, turning it over to them. So it's, that's, that's the page that I haven't had it open to. Now, I um, passed out a few handouts. <laughs> so, because I really think of this as a, a, a progress report. So basically, um, uh, the idea was that the Friends of the Library would be the publisher of this book. So I, I really am working for you. And uh, so we, we have this kind of work in progress to, uh, to produce this book. <clears throat> and so uh, it's not done. <laughs> only about half done in terms of the manuscript. And so what, I, what I've given you uh, is um, two things. 
One is the, the kind of working table of contents, and you'll see that there's kind of descriptions and even some word counts for the first four chapters or so, uh, and then there's not. That's the, those are the chapters that are written, and the rest of the chapters you'll see at the back are kind of some topics that I think would fit into those chapters, but, but they haven't been written yet. And also, um, uh, there's a brief introduction, and um, I pass that out to you also. And the introduction tries to basically you know, set the tone for this, kind of a quick overview of the history of the library, and then kind of sets the tone for, uh, for what I'm trying to accomplish uh, in the book, which is really kind of circling back to what I said in the beginning. It's not just the history in an abstract sort of way. It's telling the history really for a purpose. And the purpose is to try to move this progress, this process of, of strengthening our library forward. In, in ways that are not clear to me yet, but, but, but what we need to do is build a, a larger public awareness of, of, of the library and, and so we can build on that. So, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is, um, oh, Sam, should I just, let's see, where am I at here with this? Yep, just. Uh, right here? Yeah, right there. Aha. Uh -huh. And then, uh, how's that? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to look at this table of contents for a minute, and uh, by the way, um, there's some more copies here in case um, some people probably didn't get them, so maybe, we'll see if you can just maybe make sure it's closer to get more down. Um, So if we just look at the table of contents for a second, I just sort of give a quick overview of this, and then I'd like to talk about some particular themes uh, that I think are, are particularly important for, uh, for what I've discovered and what I think is important in terms of this large, larger project. Okay? So um, well, let me say one more thing kind of by way of introduction. When you do the history of some local thing, uh, like the Winona Library, and I, I do this in my other work too, where I'm writing, say, the National Register nomination of a particular building. What you find right away is, is that that little story, that kind of micro history of something, always fits into a much bigger picture of something that's going on in the country. Right? And it's exactly the case uh, with Winona Public Library. So every town has its own really particular unique story, and uh, we certainly do in Winona. But it's also part of a much bigger picture. So the picture is this. <clears throat> when people came, this is chapter one of the book, when people came to uh, Winona, uh, right away, and when I say people, I mean the Yankees who came to Winona first, the sort of old stock Americans who came to the East and started settling along the river here, they brought with them uh, <clears throat> literacy and also an interest in libraries, and right away they started organizing libraries. And we had a library organized right from the beginning. Uh, it didn't last very long, everything got wiped out in the fire of 1862, and then they started organizing another one. It was called the Young Men's Library Association, and they organized a little, it was a club of men, they organized a library, uh, and, and off it went. Now, these libraries were uh, fee libraries, subscription libraries. So you had to pay a fee to become a member. And so that's the way it worked. And so you pay $2 a year, you became a member of this uh, subscription library, and then you had the right to borrow the few books that they had. So it was called the Young Men's Library Association. They did a lot of fundraising, uh, including uh, uh, organizing lectures. Yeah. Uh, the lectures included people like Frederick Douglass, wow. Ralph Waldo Emerson, wow. speaking in this town, and partially fundraisers for the Library Association. And increasingly, and this goes to Annie's question, uh, women started becoming a big part of the Young Men's Library Association, so much so that eventually they changed the name because it was ridiculous, because basically women were starting to run the show anyway, uh, and they changed it to the Winona Library Association. And in fact, uh, the Winona Library Association uh, did really well, but because they were constantly fundraising, they struggled, they kind of burnt out, and in 1875, it, it actually kind of closed shop for a while. And uh, then three women, uh, rose and basically formed an executive committee and, and rescued the library and got it going again. One of those women was a 23-year-old uh, Winonan by the name of Charlotte uh, Prentice, uh, and she's uh, memorialized in the mural that, in, in the next room uh, after she was married to William Hayes, or after she died. After she was married to William Hayes and then she, he died. She died and then he had this mural painted uh, uh, in her memory. 
But from the time she was 23 until she died, she was a major part of this library in all kinds of different roles. So these three women rescued the library, and then eventually um, they got a more permanent place. Um, oh, the cleaner. <laughs> uh, how's this work? Yes. And uh, they got this old school, this school building called the Monroe Schoolhouse, and uh, this was in 4th and Lafayette, exactly where where the uh, where City Hall is today, uh, and they had the upstairs of it, and it was uh, they they hated it in the very beginning. Everything in all the minutes I've ever read always starts with "We hate being in this building." <laughs> it was cold uh, in the winter. It was hot in the summer, and they, the more books they put in, they thought it was going to fall down. And it was like, oh, it was but anyway, they were constantly trying to get another building, but nothing ever happened. So what finally happens then with the Winona Library Association? is that um, this guy comes along. Uh, after William Laird and Charlotte Prentice, the most important figure in this whole story, this is Fred Bell. And Fred Bell uh, was a lawyer from Iowa, came to town, and uh, started working for the Laird Norton Lumber Company. And not only did he start working for the Laird Norton Lumber Company, but he married uh, William Laird's, one of William Laird's daughter, uh, daughter that is Francis. And uh, so now he was a son-in-law and a rising executive of the Laird Norton Lumber Company, and also joined the board of the, Winona, of the uh, Winona Library Association. Pretty soon was the president of the Winona Library Association, and he was really the person who was kind of pushing this. So now, here's where the big picture comes in. All across the country, there's these subscription libraries in every little town. But there was also this thing called the public library movement. So all over the country, there was also people trying to push past the subscription fee library thing to a free public library, meaning a library supported by tax dollars. That was free in the sense that you didn't have to pay a subscription to, to borrow a book. And uh, people of the Little Library Association, like Fred Bell, were part of that movement. They kept pushing and pushing and pushing. So what needed to happen was that the, the, uh, the uh, state, state by state, had to pass a law authorizing cities to tax for their libraries. They couldn't do that before that. And finally, uh, in 1879, the state of Minnesota passed that law, and finally, in 1886, uh, the city of Winona passed uh, an ordinance uh, with a tax setting up the Winona Free Public Library. And so now, by this time, we are into uh, chapter two uh, of uh, my table of contents. And so um, Fred Bell then becomes the uh, president uh, of the new board uh, of the Winona Free uh, Public Library, uh, but they're still in that cruddy building. <laughs> and so, uh, this is the problem. Right from the beginning, they said, well, this is great, now we have a free public library, but we still need another building. And they kept asking the city council to do something about that, and guess what? The city council didn't do anything about it, they kept waiting. Well, uh, eventually, uh, they got the city to uh, give them uh, the Monroe School Building. And meanwhile, uh, Fred Bell was working feverishly behind the scenes, uh, talking to his uh, father-in-law, uh, who obviously wanted to make some big difference in Winona, William Harris Laird. And so what happened behind the scenes, this is all out of the public eye, in about 1894, around the Christmas holidays, William Harris Laird was out in the west, on the East Coast visiting relatives, and he met with his nephew, Warren Powers Laird, uh, who was the son of one of the other Laird brothers who had come to Winona but not become involved in the, in the lumber industry. Uh, but William uh, Warren Powers Laird was an architect, and uh, so they started hatching this plan that, that uh, William Harris Laird would uh, donate a, a library to the city of Winona, and Warren Powers Laird would, would design it. And uh, for two years behind the scenes, they traded letters with Fred Bell and uh, William Laird and Warren Powers Laird, sort of planning this building. And finally, uh, in uh, 1897, they went public. We learned in public, and made this spectacular announcement and made a proposal uh, to the city of Winona that he would uh, give them uh, a, a building designed by his nephew, and everybody could see what, what it was going to look like, it was going to look like that, <laughs> um, um, if they met certain conditions. And uh, it, it was a very uh, kind of business like proposition. I will give you this library, uh, I will spend $40,000 on it. I'll say a little bit about what that $40,000 means in today's figures in a second. Uh, if you do uh, several things, and so those, those things are, I think, are kind of important, so I want to say it exactly. Carefully 
wording conditions. First, um, he wanted um, the city to purchase the lot at, at 4th and Hamilton, where the, uh, the Monroe School Building, from the library board, the library board by this time owned it, for $5,000. In return, he would sell two lots in the southwest corner of 5th and Johnson, where we're standing right now, to the library board for the same amount, <laughs> even though they were worth more. Uh, so that the library board would then have this property uh, and the city would have that place in Fourth and Lafayette, which of course now is City College, which makes perfect sense. He would then build a library based on the plans that he had made public that his nephew had drawn up. Uh, if the city council would agree to increase the tax levy for the library from three-eighths mill to one mill on the dollar of assessed valuation of property, he asked that this increased taxation begin with the current year and that it continue for 10 years uh, or until the population would exceed 30,000. After 10 years or passing that population threshold, the tax apportion of the library will never be less than one half mil to the dollar of assessed valuation. That was the deal. The city council said, great, we'll do it. And everybody was on board, and, and so then we, we had uh, this new library being built, uh, which um, was then inaugurated uh, very quietly in a very uh, quiet ceremony just in the library with the library board of William Lair in January um, of uh, 1899, all right? Now, in chapter three, I'm gonna skip over this, but chapter three, I stop and say, okay, well, who was William Harris Laird? And why did he have so much money? <laughs> he had a lot of money. Um, and so this is really the history of the Laird Norton Lumber Company, and not just the, of Laird, but also his partners, Matthew Norton and James Norton, and really the other lumber companies here. And uh, they were uh, very closely associated with uh, Frederick Weyerhaeuser. They're kind of partners with him in all kinds of things, including the big buy of uh, Timberland in the Pacific Northwest from the Great Northern Railroad. Uh, and um, probably a lot of people in Winona were surprised when the New York newspaper in 1892 said that there were six millionaires uh, in Winona. <laughs> probably was a shock to a lot of people. And they were. Matthew Norton, James Norton, actually five millionaires at that time, they said. Um, William Laird and, and two other people. Actually, it was uh, Lamberton and, and uh, Verrazano Simpson. Uh, Who's the last one? Verrazano Simpson. So, to be a millionaire in 1892 was to be very rich. Hope you understand that. It doesn't mean much now, you know, where, you know, and, an efficiency apartment in, in Greenwich Village cost $3 million, you know, but now, now a million dollars, back then a million dollars was a lot of money. So to say that there was these five millionaires in this little town was kind of amazing, right? And it, and it was true, they were really, really wealthy. And so the chapter kind of talks about how they got so wealthy and how, and how that happened. Um, and also, um, you know, there was something else going on, which is that this whole thing about the, the Carnegie Library Program. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, in a second. Okay. In uh, um, Chapter Four, after the uh, the library was given to uh, the the, the uh, city by William Laird in 1899, January 1899, it's very interesting because the uh, the philanthropy of Laird and the and the Laird family did not stop then. And so, uh, just a few years later, and for for one thing. When this building was first built, this, the three levels of the stacks, only two were, were finished. So uh, a couple years later, the third level of the stacks was finished, he paid for that. Uh, and then in uh, uh, 1913, they, ex they extended the stacks. And you see, if you look at the back of the building, they're extended out another 20 feet or so. And, and the uh, Laird Norton families paid for that. When Laird died in 1910, he had a five thousand dollar request to, to the library, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he and other family members, and, I, and then they get to the second generation, which is Fred Bell and, and uh, Mrs. Bell, also continue. In fact, this is called the Bell Art Room, by the way, because of Fred Bell. Uh, uh, continued to give to the library. They, were, you know, they, they understood that creating this library was not just like a one shot deal that then you just walked away. That you had to continue. Uh, sustaining and supporting the library with your philanthropy. And uh, one of the big parts of that was art. And so uh, standing right next to the <laughs> Statue of Hebe, which is one of the, one of the original gifts to the library from, um, from Mrs. Laird, it came from, and uh, various other things uh, like that, including the mural that we referred to from 
dedicated to uh, Charlotte Fennis, like that, etc. So um, um, all this stuff continued. And then the, the rest of the, of the chapters, which I haven't written yet, so I won't say very much about it. <laughs> um, there to be a chapter about, um, you know, and again, this, this, is, this is part of this larger story of libraries in the 20th century. Okay, so we have this library in 1900, uh, but then what happens? Obviously, lots of things change in the library world after that. Uh, you have World War I, you have the Depression, uh, you have changing ideas about culture, uh, you have uh, uh, new ideas about how there should be a big focus on children in the library, having a children's department that started in 1921. Uh, all these kind of things are happening in the library, and that will be part of that, about that. Oh, another thing about, about that, which is uh, particularly interesting in Winona, is what about books uh, in languages other than English? So this is, this is always a really touchy issue, uh, and there's a lot of interesting things in the minutes I've been reading about that. So, uh, you know, the Germans say we want more German books, and then the next, it's interesting, the next minutes they'll say, oh, we have a letter from the Poles this week, and the Poles might have <laughs> more books too, because they heard the Germans were getting more books, etc. So it's really, there's kind of a lot of interesting things going on with respect to uh, uh, things like that. Even the, uh, the Bohemians, the Czechs in town, at one point had a petition uh, trying to get uh, some more books in, in the Czech language in, in uh, the library. They weren't very successful, though. So the Germans and the Poles were a little better at, at that. So then, uh, when we get to uh, chapter 7, this is another thing that's part of uh, almost every library story. So now you have this library uh, that's, you know, 70 years old, and um, various things are happening. Uh, there's all kinds of change in the nature of library services. The library's grown incredibly. The number of patrons is much bigger. Uh, you need more space for all kinds of things. And then somebody says, oh, by the way, um, how are handicapped people supposed to get into this building? And uh, this library and most Carnegie libraries, uh, it was the style of the day in those days, in those years. You, you always had to enter these buildings with a grand staircase. It was part of the, it's part of the style. Every single one of these buildings has, has some sort of problem. Sometimes the problem can be dealt with in a, in, in more easily than others. And this, this building had a real significant problem, which is why you know, we lost the use of the front entrance. But uh, there was a number of studies. I've just looked at these briefly now. It was amazing how many feasibility studies and all kinds of studies there were in the 70s and 80s, et cetera. And then finally, uh, the uh, early version of the Friends of the Library and other people got uh, the city council to actually put a referendum on the ballot uh, to build a whole new library, brand new library, at the foot of Huff Street uh, down by the river. And this, this referendum failed spectacularly. <laughs> <laughs> 1985. And so, uh, so obviously the, that, that chapter will be about that and what was that all about. And then of course after that, after it failed, then the city council still had to deal with what, what to do now. And so we got the, the expansion that we got in, in, in the building between then and 1989, losing the front entrance, the handicap interest there, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And then the last chapter is really kind of where we are now, what's, you know, what's happening now, uh, because it's, it's 25 years ago that, that that expansion happened. And obviously 25 years is a long time and now there's, there's more changes. Now, this is, you know, like I say, Winona struggled with this, but every other town struggled with it too. And, and that's why um, I was just reading that there were 66 Carnegie libraries uh, in uh, Minnesota, and I think only 22 of them are still actually active as libraries. Wow. And uh, another, of the other two thirds, uh, about a third have been torn down, and the other third have been used in different ways. But oftentimes, uh, uh, handicap accessibility was one of the big issues. It was, it was a constant issue, partially because of the architectural style of all those buildings. Nobody had entrances at street grade. I mean, it just was not done. It was completely not part of the, of the deal uh, of this kind of architecture. So anyway, so that's, uh, that will be uh, the last chapter kind of figuring out where we are now. Okay, any questions about that? That's, sort of, that's the overview of the book. And uh, I should say, um, you see I've got some chapter titles there, which I feel pretty good about, but I don't really feel uh, like there's a really good working title for this book yet. So we, we use the term Laird's uh, Library Legacy for the grant, 
But I, I, I don't know, it doesn't feel exactly right like a book title to me. So I'm really, if anybody has some ideas about that, that would be great. Plus, any ideas you have or comments about anything you see, uh, I would really appreciate any, any feedback. Okay? Now, what I'd like to do is to, to talk about just a, a couple of the themes uh, that, that have come out of this. Um, in my research, which I think are important for now. Here's number one. It is studying the, the level of civic engagement in the library among the wealthy and powerful upper middle class of this town in, in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, 90s, into the turn of the century. It is, it is stunning. And I want to give you just one example, but you can, you can do this at any, all kinds of different times. In uh, 19, um, I mean, excuse me, 1886, when um, the new library uh, was inaugurated by the city, so the mayor then had to appoint uh, the first board of the Winona Free Public Library. And just as an example, let me just tell you who that board was. And, and think about what it would be like if, if we had the same level of civic engagement uh, today. So uh, the board included first Fred Bell, who was obvious, he was already the, the chair of the Winona Library Association, the preceding board. Secondly, Matthew Norton, one of the Winona millionaires, one of the three founders of the Larry Norton Company, he was on, on that board. Uh, next, uh, William Mitchell, who was a sitting associate justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court at that time, <laughs> and who was later in his career going to start a law school, which is now named after him, William Mitchell Law School. He was on that board also, sitting on the, on the Minnesota Supreme Court at, at, at that time. And then uh, there was a guy named um, E.A. Gertson, this is a very interesting thing. He was a lawyer too, a probate lawyer. He had been the, the city clerk for 17 years, and he was a German-American, actually born in Hamburg. And it, it's interesting, he's an interesting story in himself because all the people on these boards uh, were Yankees, you know, people of Scotch-Irish, you know, English background usually, except for Gertson, uh, who was known as an advocate of the Germans uh, in town, okay? Then there was William Allen, who was the municipal court judge, was, was also on, on the board. Uh, and um, a woman, I, yeah. I'm sorry I don't have her, her actual name because this is the way people are identified in the press at that time. This is O.L. Marsfield. Uh, I was able to find out that Marsfield was a leading grain merchant in town. And then the last three members of the board were the three women who had saved the library back in, in 1875. Uh, Charlotte Prentice uh, and uh, uh, Mrs. Simpson, this is Thomas Simpson, who was actually Louise Bennett Simpson. Uh, she was uh, married, excuse me, not, excuse me, not Simpson, Thomas Wilson. This is Thomas Wilson. He was married to Thomas Wilson, who was a lawyer and uh, a judge and a politician at various times. And uh, this is Magahi, who was uh, the wife of a leading physician in town. So this was the board. So think about how different. <laughs> <laughs> think, think about how different that is. Now, one of the first differences is there is no such thing as a library board. We have the Friends of the Library, but this is the actual the governing board of the library, right? So, so it's, it's, yeah, you're off the hook. But, but the point is that people like William Mitchell, Matthew Norton, Fred Bill, etc., uh, it was important to them not only to be uh, donors to the library, but to be part of this body that met uh, once a month, and you can read these minutes, mm -hmm. and they're saying, oh, okay, we, are we gonna pay Jones and Kroger $5.30 this month for stationery or not? This is what they were doing, these millionaires, and we Mitchell, et cetera. In other words, they were involved in the day-to-day -day mundane running of the library. And, and that is very interesting to me. So that's, that's point one, that's kind of a theme, the level of, of civic in, engagement. Uh, point two, uh, I mentioned the size of Laird's gift. And so, um, actually what happened was, 
He said, uh, I want to give, I want to, we're going to have a budget for this building for $40,000. And as it turned out, he ended up spending $50,000. We'll come back to that in a little bit. It was, <laughs> just, the price just kept going up and he couldn't say no to his, his nephew. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but, what, what is $40,000 in, in 1897 or 1898? So, um, this is a big problem for historians because it, it's, there's no easy way to do this. I mean, we know that uh, $40,000 or $50,000 is worth a lot more today, right? But how much more? So if you, if you do the common uh, index, which is the consumer price index, $50,000 comes out to be about $1.5 million uh, in, in 2014 dollars. So at the very, very, very minimum, uh, his gift to the city was about $1.5 million. But historians will say, you know, actually this, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is not a very good measure for this kind of thing. The Consumer Price Index is, you know, measures like a bundle of common consumer goods, including food, et cetera. So, you know, it's a good way of figuring out the, the difference in the value of a potato between 1899 and now, but not necessarily very good for this kind of thing. If you, if you try to judge what it would cost to build a $50,000 building project now, using different kinds of indices, you get more in the neighborhood of about $10 million. Wow. Wow. And that, that makes sense, right? It would cost at least $10 million to build this today, probably a lot more, right? And then there are other indices that say, what does $50,000 mean in terms of uh, how much wealth one really controlled? You know, using indices having to do with per capita GDP. And then that comes out to $11, $12 million too. So basically the answer is there's no simple answer to this. It's best when people say, oh, it's $50,000 in 1899. You think of it as kind of a range, because you can't put a simple number on it. At least $1.5 million, probably more worth something like $10, $11 million. That, that was the magnitude of, of this gift uh, to the city. And as I said, it was just that wasn't the only gift, because he kept giving you know, later on. But in terms of the $50,000 given at that time. So um, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Now, third point, was there any questions? Was there, yep. just back a little, when you said they were members of the board, is there, at the library of time, is there like a paid staff? To, uh, oh, oh yes, oh yes, the same one, yes. So, um, there was um, the board, and then the, and the board, what the, the board was actually hired uh, librarians. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there was a librarian named Jeanette Clark, who was actually a librarian for the Winona uh, Library Association. And then she became the chief librarian of the Winona Free Public Library in 1887 and continued to be the chief librarian all the way until 1939. Wow. Wow. 50 years. Which yeah. was unbelievable. Wow. But uh, it, what's interesting following through these minutes, and I'm gonna, I've written more about this in, in the book, is that first there was her with a few part time help, and then there was a full time assistant librarian. Eventually there was two full time assistant librarians, and there was she and two assistant librarians and what they called an attendant, which was like a lower level, and pretty soon there was about five or six uh, full-time staff, plus a janitor, as, as things developed. And, uh, and their salaries creep up, uh, and, uh, but not fast enough, because <laughs> at one point, I just ran into these minutes a, a while ago, but in the teens, uh, the library invited uh, Clara Baldwin, who was the, the uh, uh, person from the State Library uh, Commission in St. Paul, to come down and, and, and analyze their salaries. And, and she basically said, <laughs> that the Winona librarians were getting like 50% of what they should have been getting. Wow. <laughs> so, so, the board, so the board gave them a raise, uh, but not, they didn't double their salaries, but they got, they got a raise. And then a few years later, the Depression hit, and they lost, they, they, went, they went backwards. So it's really interesting to watch their, because the, the minutes have their salaries going up and down, you know, year by year by year. Uh, because that's one of the things the board did, was set their salaries. And also set whether they were going to have paid vacations, not, so yeah, yep. On that budget, so when the library had a board, so we had the city collected the taxes yes. and the fees, and then the board was given that entire budget yep. and managed everything, yep. every penny. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, they got, it was just transferred from the city that, that amount. Uh, yeah. And of course, they had you know they had um, some other income that they generated also. Yeah, but yeah, it was mostly that. Right. But they were, they were paid for? No, no, they weren't paid for. No, they hired the But the staff was paid. Yeah, yep. I'm interested in 
so all these very wealthy people got together to, to create this and sustain it. What were they, what did they believe would come? <laughs> what, what kind of ideas of citizenship, uh, what is going on there? Well, this, this is a really, um, among historians, there's a lot of debate about this. Yes. So there's various ways you can look at it. There's, there's a certain point of view that says, these wealthy people did this uh, for no other reason but to control the working class. You know, yeah. By controlling what they could read or hear or whatever, whatever. So that, that, that's one argument. Yeah. Uh, and another argument would be, well, they, I mean, they really believed in, you know, in, in education and enlightenment, and at least in their view of it, and, and you know, wanted to share that. It's a little bit more benign view. Uh, so that, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, um, in, among historians, it's kind of a contentious issue, exactly what was going on. How much was it about control? How much was it not? My view is that, you know, really what, it was obviously partially about control. It wasn't as if, you know, Winona was not a, a town that was um, um, strewn apart by labor militants here or anything. So I mean, that, that, it wasn't really, I don't think there was much fear about that. Uh, but certainly, these uh, upper middle class people had a very powerful view of culture, which is why they had, for example, this art group. So they went to Europe and brought these things back to share with everybody. And they really thought it was important uh, that everybody kind of be able to partake in that. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of paternalistic, uh, but, I, but it was kind of well-meaning. Uh, the other thing about this for me that's important is that, however paternalistic it might, it might have been, in terms of their cultural idea. What they did was, at least William Blair in this particular case, is he donated uh, and created a free public space. You know, because what happens is he says, okay, if you do this, if, you, if the city agrees to this taxation, I will build this library and give it to you. Mm -hmm. Not like a lot of donors today who want to keep control of what they give. He said, here it is, I walk away, the only requirement is, is that you tax yourself to sustain this building. Otherwise, I don't, I'm not going to say anything about what goes on inside here. You know, of course, Fred Bell and other people were going to you know, have a say about the, what was in the collection, what magazines were carried, or whatever. So there's this, this creation of a free public space that I think is really important. Because even if you could say, well, at the time, they were only having things that kind of supported a, you know, a capitalist worldview or whatever, Nevertheless, that free public space continues over time, and it still exists today. And so I think it's really important. Marcia? I, I want to say, Greg's doing two of the polls about these views, and it's the same kind of debate about social work, and any kind of social services. You know, the settlement houses. Were the settlement houses really benefiting, you know, the immigrants, or were the settlement houses to train them to be what we thought Americans should be, including eating American cooking and away from, you know, their heavily spiced foods. So there's all that debate. But if you follow the women that set up the settlement house, they were pretty progressive in many ways. But there's also the no less of leash. But you're missing, I think, one point about this, which is what do you think a democracy takes? And we saw that really powerful quote when we were in the New York Public Library mm -hmm. in Christmas, that you can't have a democracy without an educated, literate, people and that's what this library is for that's why it's here and it's beautiful it's it's magnificent it's for everybody it's not like okay we're going to give the cheapest budget we're going to get we're going to skimp here because it's a public body you know you see the magnificence that people of any income level could walk in i mean that's what i think is so powerful about it this is one of is a beautiful building much more expensive than many of the carnegies so, and just, so all of this, to a young child, and this is what learning is about, I mean, there's all the mixed things, too, but I think the other part of it is very powerful to me. When you think about debates about public buildings now, it's always act, act, cut, instead of what's the most beautiful, what can we do, what's going to endure, so. Um, yeah, I just going to ask you about the city charter and the end of the library. I just want to go. <laughs> I don't, well, I haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> but, but, I mean, obviously there was this reform, not just having to do with the library, but across the whole city, that reorganized the way the city was operating. And, that, and what happened then is that the library represented, and the, uh, the library director then reported, you know, directly to the, to the city administrator, I guess, and, and that's, that's, that's how it was reorganized. And I, I don't know, I, 
I will find out, but I just haven't researched that yet, what kind of debates there were about that. But, but it was, it's a really good question because, um, you know, obviously if you have a library board like this with Fred Bell and these people who are uh, rich, powerful people who are also really strong advocates of the library, that was good. That was very good. I mean, I, I mean there was once, I was seen in there where, where Fred Bell came to city council uh, to ask for, for something from city council, and standing behind him are William Mitchell and Matthew Norton. And uh, the city council goes, oh, this is, this is you know, important. Now, when Chad goes and speaks to the city council, they also they stand up and feel like <laughs> <laughs> But maybe not quite as much as William Mitchell and Matthew Norton were standing behind you, <laughs> saying, we're behind Chad. We, we, whatever he wants, we want it. So that was, that was very important. And when you get rid of that board, I think it, it actually it weakens the situation. Yep. I'm willing to uh, grant that these rich folks of the day was part of their civic duty, et cetera, and education and giving the benefit of the doubt, but I wondered if there was perhaps one other motivation. I just thought mm -hmm. it was, they were in the lumber business. Yep. What do you do with lumber? You make paper. Uh, secondly, I will give you 
uh, a grant equal to about uh, two dollars per year population. So if you have a city of 10,000 people, it'll give you $20,000. And don't be arguing about that, if that's what it's going to be. Okay? Uh, and it's got to be a real free public library. In other words, it's got to be a tax supported library. And finally, and this is really important, you've got to agree to maintain your library at the tune of 10% of whatever grant we give you. So if we give you a $20,000 grant, you have to agree to pay $2,000 a year uh, to, to, to uh, finance your library uh, after that to sustain it. So that's the way it worked. And, and they were strict about that. And I was just reading a very funny story. I thought it was funny anyway, because uh, Northfield, home of Carleton College and St. Olaf College, uh, applied for a Carnegie Library grant. Uh, and they, they weren't a very big town. And uh, Carnegie or Bertram offered them $10,000 based on their population. And the city fathers of Northfield wrote back and said, hey, what, you know, we're Northfield. <laughs> we, are, we are an exceptional town. We are much more highly educated than any other town, whatever. We, we have to have a better library than that. We need to have $15,000. And Bertrand wrote back and said, I don't care. <laughs> you, you, you get $10,000 just like any other town your size. I mean, forget it. It was it. That was it. And they, 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 wrote, they kept going back. Huh. We are so much more, you don't, you don't realize that this is Northfield you're talking to, and he said, I don't care. They got $10,000. Um, now, Laird, on his own, basically set up a similar thing. He said to Winona, okay, we have to have a suitable site, and we already saw that he kind of made the arrangements so that the site would be used, right? Uh, and, and he... Um, the grant that he first had in mind was $40,000, which was just about exactly what Carnegie would have given, because the city population was about 20,000, so that was just about right. Uh, the only thing he did a little bit differently, he was also concerned with long-term maintenance, but he, but he used this mill rate idea rather than the 10% idea, which actually I think was smarter. Because what happened with a lot of Carnegie libraries is that the 10% of the initial grant didn't, didn't uh, take into account inflation of maintenance costs. And that was, I don't know what Carnegie was thinking, but anyway. Uh, and so that, that was not so good, right? But the other thing that was different was is, is that uh, William Laird couldn't hold it for $40,000. <laughs> so he, he got his, uh, his nephew, who was this head of the architecture school at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and another architect was brought in, and they started sending plans back here for this grand building, and, uh, and um, Guess what? It started costing more than forty thousand dollars. We had this this really interesting back and forth in the uh, in the uh, correspondence, where you know uh, Larry and Bell say, "Well, we took your plans to our local contractor here, Henry Barrett, and Barrett says we'll never be able to build this building for forty thousand dollars." And the architects say, "Well, sh we can't believe that." Well, on the East Coast, we certainly could. They said, "Well, we, I don't know what we can do it." So they went back and forth. How are we going to do this? And uh, Warren Powers, Larry, the nephew, said, "Look." We really want to have this white Bedford stone, this Indiana limestone, this beautiful white Bedford stone, not just brick. Uh, and we want to, and this dome is really important because we really want to build this building that's really a monument that really stands out. And uh, they kept going back and forth, and eventually, obviously, Laird slowly but surely uh, kind of moved because he ended up spending fifty thousand dollars on this building. And that's why, in the end. It's, it is a much nicer building than your average Carnegie Library. It, it's similar to Carnegie Libraries in many respects, uh, but uh, all, most Carnegie Libraries are brick, and this building is brick with this uh, Bedford Stone you know, covering on top of it, so it looks much nicer. And Carnegie would have said that that dome is a complete extravagance. I mean, what, what does that have to do with the library? Yeah. That, basically, the, when you come to that building room, it's, it's just like a grand lobby. And Carnegie would have said that's just wasted space. Uh, but they, they got it, and, uh, and so they ended up paying more. So uh, I just want to show you a few. Greg, there's a got question. Hey, yep. oh, I sorry. have a question. Just yep. come. What you're just describing is called an edifice complex. <laughs> <laughs> and in this case, it worked hard. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, so um, these are the plans. By the way, this is something else that was that was found uh, in our archives here. Um, and you see this that, that grand dome uh, is just you know really uh, kind of above and beyond the call of duty for library. And this is a cross section, uh, which is very interesting because the dome actually 
uh, is uh, there's two domes. So there's the outer dome that you see from the street, and then there's the inner dome that you see when you look up at the, the big rose uh, glass window. And there's a big gap in between the two, as you can see in, in the thing. And also, above this, there was also a skylight, which is that there. Well, all these skylights are now closed, and they're all lit by natural light. But there was, you see the skylight uh, above here. And of course, uh, many of you probably know that there was a spiral staircase right, right in the middle of where you're yep, See right there? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this was the art room that went down into another uh, art room, which was called the cast room, where there was sculpture. Oh. So this, of course, is uh, what you see when you walk out. You know, one of the things that whenever I work on a building like this, it's, it's very interesting. I'm sure you have the same experience. I've been in this library a million times, but you kind of start taking it for granted. You don't really look at it very closely at it. I mean, that, that uh, dome art glass is really exceptional. And it was done by a pretty well-known New York arts and crafts uh, art glass guy named Otto Heineke, um, you know, who's written up in the books as a major art glass, but he's a very major piece of work out there. Uh, and I, I wanted to say, I was, when I was thanking the library staff, a couple days ago I came over and Riley, who's the janitor in this building, took me on a little tour, and we went out on the roof and went into the dome and this is what you see, uh, the ironwork holding the upper and lower dome together. It's really, really quite remarkable to be in there. Um, and it, it's, it's quite a thing. And so you see now it's got LED lights. That's what's shining through the art glass as it was natural light. But anyway, it's really cool in there. Will there be photos in the book? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. oh, what did I do? Uh, and then, of course, the white Bedford stone really made a big difference. It was just brick. This, this picture kind of brings out it was on a sunny day how, um, you know, what was this? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm going backwards. Greg, that was the one thing I thought they did was when facing, well, that looks really sunny, but mostly because it's facing north. Yeah. There's yeah. hardly any sunlight that really right. gets on the building as a photographer. It's very yeah. <laughs> and the other thing, I'm saying, I don't know what you mean. Somewhere. The other thing is that, uh, the interior woodwork, of course, all of which was supplied by the Larry Darton Company, I think is also exceptional. Again, we kind of take it for granted, but these spectacular oak columns that are all over, and in and, and, and pairs, no less, I mean, are, are, just, are just remarkable. Whoops. Um, there's the reading room. Um, this is just shortly after it opened. And of course, uh, when you came in through the main entrance, there are they are electric lights, yeah. It was, it, was a, it was a very early electric electrified building. You see the circulation desk, uh, and I'll show you a little bit about the, the floor plan. Where did they go when they were renovating electric lights? Fixtures. I don't know. Um, those are original fixtures. They have electric lights. They just convert them. Oh, So these are the floor plans originally, and it's it's kind of interesting because to see how the building was used at the time. And so obviously, uh, when you came in the main entrance, you went into what was called the exchange room under the big dome, which is really like kind of a glorified lobby. And then past the exchange room was the circulation desk. And behind the circulation desk, what was called the librarian's room. And behind that was the door to the stacks. And so the, that was the only entrance to the stacks. So basically, uh, the stacks were closed at that time. And at some time, they got open. I have, I'm going to try to figure out when that happened. But this is another issue that was going on in the library world. Should the stacks be open or closed? And obviously, the Winona Library had closed stacks at, at the beginning. They had this huge reading room, and then uh, which is now the uh, AB room was the, uh, was, the, was the reference room. And then in the basement, below the reading room, in what's the children's library today, was this huge uh, lecture room. It was a very big room that sat about 250 people. And it was constantly used by clubs and uh, other, other groups in town uh, for lectures and talks uh, and meetings. And uh, there was a separate entrance to it. Uh, I was thinking about this today because now you know, we're having this meeting in here. And the library is closed. And it's kind of this awkward situation because you have to come through the library to get to this meeting. But it used to be that you would come to a lecture by that basement entrance. The basement entrance now is a, is a window. It's closed up. Uh, but it was designed this way so people could use this, uh, use the lecture hall, uh, even when the library uh, was closed. And here's the art room, of course. And this is the the uh, thing around the spiral staircase. Um, and this was really um, 
not seen as a room for books. It was purely an art gallery. It's called the art gallery. And it really shows how, uh, for the folks who were responsible for this library, art was really important. And they had constant changing art shows here. Uh, and you know, we know about some of them because uh, well, there's been things written. Uh, uh, I can't think of his name right now. The festival we had. Rockwell Kent. Rockwell Kent and his show in here, et cetera. Thank you very much. Uh, now, one last point. When I think about uh, the civic engagement uh, of these guys and, and trying to make sense why uh, were they so interested in, in donating so much time, so much money to operating the library and these other organizations that they were so uh, much a part of, one of the answers I think is, you could say, kind of geographical. And, and, the, and the fact of the matter is, they all lived in this neighborhood, within a couple blocks of this building. And so uh, this is uh, William Laird's house on 359 West 4th Street. Um, so it's you know, just kind of a couple blocks, and this is the Coke profiles over there, just because they had the Lamberton house. Uh, the house is gone now, there's something else there now. Uh, but just to give you an idea how close he was, uh, and um, Matthew Norton's house was at 254 West 5th Street, which is now um, the Y parking lot. Uh, and so, but, I mean, the, way, the reason that happened was um, um, all the Lairds and Norns were very big donor, donate, donors to the Y. And uh, by the way, I brought this picture in over there, leaning against the wall. Right kitty corner from where we're standing now in the, in the Winona Library was the Y uh, building that was built in 1906. And, um, and the Larry Norton families were huge donors, and all, a lot of Larry Norton Norton people were on the board, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so when that building burned down in 1946, and then they, or whatever, it was, it was 1949, and then they started talking about building a new uh, Y, the, uh, the Norton family uh, donated this house to the Y uh, it was part of the site for the new Y, so it was torn down. Uh, uh, so it was unfortunate. And then this is uh, the third founder of the Larry Norton Company, James Norton, 275 West Wabashaw. This is uh, now under Central Lutheran Church. <laughs> so and that house is gone also. But um, the point is, is that uh, the three Norton, Larry Norton founders, and uh, people like Fred Bell and William Hayes and all these and all these people in sort of the second generation, they all lived around here. So what I did was, and afterwards you can take, come up and take a look at this, I, uh, over at the historical society, I printed out uh, some pieces of the Sanborn insurance maps uh, for about 1908. The Sanborn insurance maps are a uh, spectacular source for historians. What they were was that uh, these guys would come around to all these cities and they do these very detailed large maps uh, with every single uh, structure on them, indicating whether the structure was wood framed or brick or whatever, and they were they were they it helped the insurance companies decide who to insure for what amount because they're all worried about fire. But now they're this terrific source, so I, I got some copies and I pasted them together, sort of this neighborhood around the library, and so you can see how close uh, Laird and the two Nortons and Fred Bell and William Hayes and other people in, from that crew word to the library. They're all just two or three blocks away. Plus, the Laird family was uh, deeply involved in First Congregational Church, which of course is just across Broadway, and the Norton family was deeply involved in Central Methodist, just across the street. Right? So their two churches were right here also. They were very deeply involved in the Y, which was just kitty corner from this building. They were also very deeply involved in, in the Masons, which of course in 1908 was built the other end of the block. And then between the Masonic Temple and the library, in 1917, the Laird Norton Company built the Laird Norton Building right next door. Yeah. So this neighborhood, I mean, this was their neighborhood. And so it's, when, when you think about giving all this money to the library, it wasn't like they were giving it to some foreign mission or something. This was, this was, this was their neighborhood. This was their building. This is what they would walk to. Uh, and walk by, and uh, this was going to make their own lives enriched besides whatever good it might do to anybody else. So I think that's another important thing to think about in terms of understanding the context of this. So I think I will stop unless there's any other uh, questions or any advice that anybody wants to give me about how to do this. Um, 
I found one uh, note about after the library was built, there was a lot of people who gave donations of art, and Paul Lackens gave something. Not very, not very big. <laughs> but you know, I, I think the Watkins had their own philanthropy, and um, you know, there's various things you could give to. Uh, and so, he's, you know, who knows? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but um, the Laird and Norton people, besides the library, were also very big in terms of building the park system. And you know, I think it's a really important thing to remember. And then their, their offspring, or I mean, their second generation, like Fred Bell, continued that. And we're just talking about this because Fred Bell, in 1923, donated to the city the band shop. Mm -hmm. It was kind of one of these sort of one huge gift sort of thing, just like a, So he, he kind of followed in the footsteps of his father-in-law uh, with that level of philanthropy. But again, creating the public space uh, and turning it over to the city. So, yep. so Lovey Park at that time was also created as a public space, much like Central Park, mm -hmm. so it would be a civilizing influence on the workers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was the same. I, I don't know what, quite what time that was. Yeah, I think it was the 1800s. Yeah, it was the same sort of thing. It was kind of, you know, uh, what, what they call the city beautiful movement. You know, it's, you create these beautiful city places that would, I guess, that was civilizing influence on all of us. I don't know. But yeah, that was the idea. City beautiful. I like the name. City beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's what, that was actually kind of a movement. Yeah, Daniel yeah, Burnham, yeah. Fred Wall, <laughs> yeah. Central Park, I mean, they were all, all part of that same idea. And nature was part, a big part of that. Yeah. And Greg, I mean, Fred Bell was on the park board. And Fred Bell was on the park board, and, that, and, that, um, and so was Matthew Norton. And so the, the, park, the park district expanded greatly under their, under their uh, but they also donated big money to expanding Lake, Lake Park. Any other comments or questions? Well, thank you very much.